So with that, I get the privilege of kicking us off with our first panel. I would like to welcome to the stage North Carolina Superintendent Catherine Truitt and State Senator Michael Lee to share about North Carolina's Department of Public Instruction and the North Carolina General Assembly are collaborating to measure outcomes and sustain high impact ESSER activities. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to give just a little bit of background. You guys will see their bios in our program, but Senator Lee has served as a North Carolina state senator from 2014 to 2018, was reelected in 2020, and is currently serving his fourth term. He serves on the board of directors for the Hunt Institute and is a Hunt Keen Fellows member. Catherine Truitt, has service in education, began as a high school English teacher where she spent 10 years in the classroom at both the high school and middle school levels. And she has served as the North Carolina State Superintendent since 2021. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. So we know, I'm going to set the stage for this, we know that ESSER funds ending this September, it's important to know where these investments have been made what kind of impact they've made, how we sustain the ones that have been most high leverage. And that's a big part of the equation for the two of you. So uh, Superintendent Shrew, can you tell us the story of how ESSER investments for North Carolina? Well, th first of all, thank you for asking us both to be here. We're, we're really excited to have the opportunity to be on stage together and share some of the amazing work that we've done through our partnership in North Carolina. We received about six and a half billion dollars of ESSER. Uh, we're the ninth largest state in the, in the country and we have about one, one and a half million public school students. Um, as you all know, 90% of, of the dollars went out to the districts. And what I would say is that um, w when we look at how ESSER was spent across one, two, and three, we see, of course, COVID mitigation strategies with ESSER one. And then ESSER two, we see, um, the legislature mandated summer school that, that first summer out of the pandemic. Um, and that, you know, I have to say I was a little bit skeptical about that at first, but we did a lot of data collection and we learned that about of, of all of the students who attended summer, summer school, 86% of those who attended had been identified by their teacher as in need of, of extra uh, summer learning. Um, and then we started to see some more, as we collected more data at the department, which I'll talk about in a little bit, we, we started tailoring our summer programming more and our in-school year programming around um, career accelerator programming to get high school kids engaged back in school. Um, we did a lot of, our, our data showed that middle school math was where the biggest drop in academic achievement was. So we did a lot of math boot camps. Um, we also did bridge academies over the summer for fifth graders going into middle school and eighth graders going into to ninth grade. And then um, Senator Lee will talk also about, um, we spent about $50 million of ESSER money um, on um, letters PD for our teachers. We are an all-in science of reading state and looking forward to sharing some of that data with you this morning. Well, you, know, you could have been set up for uh, a moment where you had disagreement about how to spend the funds, but, but you all worked together to try and figure out how to make that happen. I want to talk about the relationship between the North Carolina legislature and the department and those, uh, the funds that were set aside for the SEA, how that came about. Michael, can you talk a little bit about like, the legislature's role in that and, and how you approached it? Sure. And, you know, it you work really closely for, with DPI, our Department of Public Instruction, in kind of finding out what the priorities are. Um, DPI gives us a lot of data, and, and most legislators are really interested in data. The, the challenging part sometimes from the legislative perspective, I'm in the North Carolina Senate. We have a counterpart um, in the House. Um, the Senate's much more reasonable. The House sometimes not. <laughs> And so you don't have any colleagues watching online. No. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. Um, no, but um, to be able to to work with, with Catherine and her team and then also to be able to partner with our counterparts uh, in the House, also dealing with leadership and then other members who have um, ideas, um, some that are, are valid and, and very good moving forward. Some are very localized, some not. 
In North Carolina, you know, we have a lot of metro areas, but we have a lot of rural areas. And so sometimes that can give us some, some consternation as far as just trying to get, um, get agreement by all parties. But certainly partnering with DPI, getting the data, finding out what's going on around the country is, is vitally important. And I think we had a, a really good relationship in kind of moving the ball forward with what was a really difficult time. Superintendent, talk about some of the guardrails or how you how you worked with the legislature to decide. Well, in North Carolina, um, money that comes from the federal government actually, by law, is appropriated by the by the General Assembly. So it was really important that we not only have good communication, but that we had the data to give the legislators so that they could make data informed decisions. I, I think what I always tell people to, to or suggest that they remember is that you know legislators are um, serving their area um, and their their constituency, but if they have a leadership position like Senator Lee, then they're um, you know they're trying to serve the whole state. So they they need data in order to make the best decisions possible. And so knowing that, um, I created the Office of Learning Recovery which was designed to be a, um, a, a, a research arm that we, that we did not have at the department prior, and, and also provide technical assistance to our districts um, so that we could have a very robust academic recovery lens as well as data-driven policy decision lens. And I think that it was um, our, our partnership with SAS, the Office of Learning Recovery had a partnership with SAS that allowed us to use all of our longitudinal data in North Carolina to build out our lost instructional time report. We were able to take that data and show the legislature where all the biggest gaps were, but we were also able to partner with our 115 superintendents and um, hold convenings and show their chief academic officers you know, where they needed to spend them, where they should spend their money, you know, because as state chiefs, we all know that we, we can't tell um, our local superintendents how, how to spend that 90%. And um, um, we actually, I think I have some slides to show. If, yes. Um, academic recovery. Um, what, of course I can't, oh, there it is, there, there, <laughs> right yeah. in front of me. Um, and, and so what, what are, this, this shows here what the percentage of schools with an overall improvement from 2021 to 2023. So these are our end of grade and end of course tests. And what, what we saw um, was that between those two years, given all of the data that we were able to, to give to the legislature to drive policy decision making as well as to local superintendents, that we, we were able to say, oh hey, look, our, our, our reading efforts are, are paying off in, in um, elementary school, but look, not so much in middle school. So we're going to focus this short session on middle grades reading. Yeah, and yeah. to dovetail off of that, you know, Office of Learning uh, Research, Recovery, but uh, I now think it's going to be research. <laughs> I mean, OLR is, is one of those things that, that we um, have learned through the pandemic that can create the data that legislators really need. And, and so OLR, OLR is partnering with what we call in North Carolina the NC Collaboratory. The NC Collaboratory was actually formed back in 2016, and it was really um, a center without walls, essentially housed within the UNC system, whereby they were able to do research to inform policymakers on what at the time was really environmental policy so that we could get good data from that perspective. And so what the collaboratory would do is they would find out who the best researcher was in a particular area across the system, not just within the traditional public system, but in some of the privates, whether it's Duke or Wake Forest, and have some really robust research by those who are experts. That actually dovetailed into working with OLR, and um, I think they've got 90 related research studies um, on COVID, and I think 10 of those relate to K-12, if I recall correctly. Um, 20. 20 relate to K-12 mm -hmm. education, $74 million of an investment over across the whole 90, uh, which, which really is a, a robust way to get data and research through those who are the experts, so you can get research informing policy and policy um, moving out um, into instruction. 
So, I mean, you're talking about some of the data, but if, uh, if you would talk about how the data has helped you hone what it is that you're, you look at to keep. Like once the investments are there, and, uh, are gone, and the legislature is making decisions about that, how have those conversations gone? Well, from, from our standpoint, one of the things that the Office of Learning Research did was to, uh, first of all, create a spreadsheet that tells anyone at any given time where the money is, where, where have those ESSER dollars gone. But then we also created a, a funding cliff um, dashboard. We, love, we all love a dashboard in education, don't we? <laughs> um, and so we, we have that dashboard that, that um, has been encouraging local leaders to start thinking about you know, we, we, we advised, of course, you use as little of this money as possible for FTE, and we are seeing our larger districts did not heed that advice, our smaller districts did. And so our smaller districts will see much less of a funding cliff. But we also created something called the ESSER Toolkit, and I would encourage you to, to check this out um, if you have a chance. Um, so the ESSER Toolkit is designed to um, sh sh allow for districts to look at how they spent their money, what the student outcomes were, and it gives them an ROI calculator and also a zero-based budgeting template so that they can go in and start to prioritize, you know, this is how we spent our money, here's what the student outcomes were, here's how much this costs, um, we, we know this works, so we're, we're going to start budgeting for this. Yeah, Senator, like some of the investments that you, the legislature will make then are obviously predicated on what you learned from this. What are the future conversations? They are, and, and I think Catherine mentioned earlier the Excellence in Public Schools Act, where we kind of transform literacy instruction in North Carolina to the science of reading, um, and, and well beyond that, a lot of folks just talk about the science of reading. But there, there's a whole plan in place with individual reading plans and, and the whole nine yards that kind of dovetail uh, with that. Looked at Mississippi uh, as part of that template. Utilized federal funding really to provide professional development across the state um, to really retrain um, teachers in, in, in pre-K through three. Something else we have, um, we utilized uh, within this particular legislation is to put an early childhood, early learning division within DPI. In North Carolina, it's handled with our Health and Human Services so that they could coordinate together so that science of reading could start actually in, in certain pre-K environments. The $50 million that was invested of, of ESSER dollars into a lot of that training is going to when, even though that money is running out, we're going to have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars moving forward of investment that will continue in this plan um, moving forward. Not all of that's the science of reading. It's about $300 million of, of revised literacy, but a big chunk of it is going to kind of revolve around that new literacy instruction that we have. Do you think without the evidence, which we see a huge uh, chart here, do you think without that point of evidence that the investments could have been made in that way? I mean, it seems like very pointed towards. The, the ESSER dollars was used for the initial kind of big chunk of training, but without the evidence showing that it worked, you would not see the significant dollars continuing. And now, as, as Catherine mentioned, you know, we're, we're kind of topping out of third grade and now we have some middle school. We'll be able to take this data, move these programs and make the investment up through um, the middle, uh, middle school area. Do you want to talk about this chart? Yeah, uh, I, this, this is um, part of our, our year over year um, model where we uh, looked at, at scale score changes over time in order to, to get student level data. I want to be clear that what, what separates North Carolina's lost instructional time reporting is that it was um, not a convenience study as we've seen most nonprofits do. It was actually um, looking at individual student level data. Um, and so what we see here is that of, of all of our tested subjects in grades uh, three through high school, third grade reading is the only subject that has crept above pre-pandemic levels. And um, Amplify is our, our K3 um, provider of, of testing. And what we're seeing is that um, Having invested these dollars in letters professional development for all 44,000 pre-K through fifth grade teachers, we're seeing incredible gains in those foundational K-3 um, assessments that are finally leading to movement in third grade. And remember, our third graders, when we started testing uh, last year, um, 
our third graders were the ones who missed all of kindergarten right. and half of first grade. And so nationally, we're seeing things sort of flat in third grade, but, but we're finally starting to see it, it trend up. Um, and our, our gains are um, not just uh, white kids, <laughs> they're all kids are seeing gains in, in the science of reading. Um, our Asian population had the, had the least amount of growth to make. They're upwards of about 83% proficient right now. But, um, and, the, and the gaps are still there, but they are narrowing in a way that we've not, not seen in North Carolina. Um, and these, these double digit gains are just, um, uh, I think, really indicative of the legislature's commitment to solving this, this literacy challenge that we have. And as I mentioned before, our data shows that middle school math uh, and elementary math are where we need to go and that, that's our plan for short session. So let's, let's talk a little bit about sustainability because we, know, we talked about this, the funding cliff, the, the end to the funds. Um, and I'd love to hear a little more. I, obviously, one of the things you guys both talked about was having data to make informed decisions, but what are some of the best practices that you would want to see continue between the legislature and, and DPI? So, so from my perspective, <clears throat> from my perspective, you know, the taking new programs that, that we think will work and utilizing OLR and the collaboratory to kind of bring us back research. Uh, a lot of, so in the legislature, we have something new, we ask for a report, the report comes back, and half the report is just reciting what the statute said that you wanted them to, to do. And then it's kind of milk toast the report that you get back, but they check the box, I provided the report. And so um, it, it just doesn't always give you what you want. It's great that, that we have someone like Catherine in her position because that's not what she does, but that's a lot of times what happens in other reports, and I'm not sure what happens in other states. So having this combination of OLR helping to frame the issue of what we're trying to accomplish, the collaboratory then develops the grant, pushes the grant out to whoever the experts are in higher ed and to the systems, and then is able to get that research back, collaborate with OLR again, and then get that data to us is incredibly important, and I think it should be a best practice um, everywhere. And I'm, Sad to say that we're just now getting there, um, and it took a pandemic to, to get to that point, but, but I think we've, we've really got something pretty strong. I, I'd love to give a specific example. Sure. Um, so we have two, um, uh, I'm sure we have more, but we have two pretty well-known high dosage tutoring initiatives in our state. One of them is kind of statewide, and the other one is in a local large rural district. Um, and that, that smaller high dosage tutoring initiative um, is one of the 20 studies that the senator mentioned uh, that's part of the collaboratory. And we just got that research back and it is showing statistically significant gains for students um, who have received high dosage tutoring following the model. The, the other program that we have, um, which has also been researched, is sh not showing statistically significant gains. And there's a lesson to be learned in how one was implemented versus the other one. And, and so, that's going to definitely have an impact on where the legislature goes with these initiatives. Yeah, the, the dollars involved, uh, in particular, with the high doses tutoring. It's okay. Um, I mean, it will make a big difference yes. in how those dollars are allocated moving forward. Yeah. I think also the through line through here, to your point, um, Michael, is like, it's not a single year report. And even if it's a really robust single year report, which is not what you described, um, it's still not a single year report. It's multiple years. And I mean, I think some of the things that we've seen over the time on the implementation of science of reading is it takes time to um, take hold and it takes time to start to see some of the um, evidence and, and that's what you guys are talking about. Yeah, so. and, and you can drill down with, a, with the research, well, what learning interventions are working, which ones right. aren't. And, and yeah. so you can really drill down and what, what a lot of times is a much broader policy to help kind of tweak things as it goes on. And then having, you know, folks who are in the business of doing research, um, kind of pulling that information together and updating, because as we all know, times change, things change, uh, instruction changes. And so that's really important to kind of bring that to current. Do you think, Michael, do you think that has um, compressed the number of topics that your education committees or legislature has talked about? 
so there are 170 legislators and anyone can file a bill. Yeah. <laughs> I just wondered if it's, if it's honed it a little more. Um, I think what it will do in the future when, when legislators come and they have these great ideas, and we all have wonderful ideas, all 170 of us, <laughs> uh, and then we know that there's going to be a researcher that's vetting the success of that idea, I think it will help some legislators kind of, you know, be a little more focused in, in what they're proposing, and then it will enable us um, as a legislature to be able to evaluate this. Okay, did that work or not? Do we need to keep doing this? Do we need to try and scale it because it is so successful, or do we need to kind of do something different? Yeah. I think there was something like last session, last long session, something like 800 bills filed that touched on education. So what he's saying is crucial for our work as well. Because we're all experts at education because we all went to school. Yes, because yes. we all went to school. That's yes. absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yes. So I want to ask you about advice you would give to other states, given what you've learned about, um, learned about the data. Um, and we're going to talk about the ROI tool here in a minute. But advice you would give to others that this relationship has worked pretty well, and you guys have um, worked um, together with information and data. But what's advice you would give? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, Catherine does a really good job. So there, if you've ever dealt with the legislature, you know. Um, you've kind of got, you know, legislators, then you have kind of chairs of committees, ed committees, ed appropriations. Then you have kind of a base budget, which kind of is overarching, usually deals with salaries and things like that. And then you've got leadership. And so um, I think the, what Catherine does so well at is that she knows how to kind of work each of the levels you know, some of the, and I'll say department heads, um, other departments, they don't really know how, they just go straight to the top or they just stick with a committee chair and they don't realize that, that legislatures, you know, we all, you know, in the Senate and in the House, we get together as caucuses, we get together as committees, and there's a lot of consensus building that goes on. And if you just kind of focus in just one area, you may get that one thing done, but that will not bode well for you kind of as you move on. And then the second piece is that, that I think that has been done so well is, is just whenever we have meetings, there's always the data. Here's, here's what we have found. Or if it's new, this is what we want to try. This is what we think we're going to be able to figure out. And these are the metrics by which we're going to use in order to determine if we were successful. And, and that, to me, resonates in a very significant way. You want to talk about advice? And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the ROI tool, too. Yeah. So. Well, um, so the ROI tool is, I think, a game changer because, um, again, legislators have a million things coming at them in, in, you know, from their constituents as well as what's happening in their committee work and their, their, their chairmanships. Um, and, and so having um, very specific asks that are backed by data um, which is what this tool will, will do for legislators. So if you have a, a local superintendent who wants to go to their legislator and, and ask that legislator to champion something for them, the ROI tool will help. But it, it, it's also helping districts build their budget. And um, I, I think that, you know, I'm, tr I'm, I'm squaring in my head lately this idea that supposedly we have this massive teacher shortage, yet we're going to have to fire all of these people. Um, from you know all the FTE who, who were hired, um, it seems like there's a solution there someplace. But um, I, I think that um, having having a tool that helps local again when you're we're, we're, Michael said it so well. We've got big urban centers, but we also 80% of North Carolina is rural. Some of our lo local districts only have maybe five people in their central office. They need technical assistance. And, and this ROI tool is providing that for them. Will bigger districts need to use this? Maybe not, but certainly our, our smaller districts who are kind of sometimes feel like they're on an island um, need help figuring out how they can advocate for what's working for their communities. Um, I, I think that, that one of the things that I learned pretty, pretty quickly after taking office during the pandemic was, was that we did have to bring data. You know, in God we trust, all others bring data. And um, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I mean, I, 
there was part of me that wanted to say the legislature just trust me i'm i'm the education expert just just do what i say and it doesn't work that way we, we all know uh, and, not for very long anyway <laughs> yeah exactly 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 so i i think um you know there's there's so much noise right and out there in education and legislators get that noise all the live long day and you have to find a way to build trust, to help them filter out the noise, to help them in a non-threatening way, um, and, and to um, be a partner so that, um, and, and, and help show them how to put kids at the center of, of all you do. Because so much of what we're doing is filtering out the noise. And, and so I, I so appreciate legislators who are, like, like Michael, who are willing to, um, do the hard work of trying to learn what problems we're trying to solve in education. I mean, our legislators are part-time legislators. Michael has a whole other job to do. And education is hard, healthcare is hard. And so for those legislators who really take the time to learn and, um, and then learn to trust is, I, I think, key to making things move forward. Michael, when we were talking, preparing for this, you talked about the ROI tool as being game changing. And you alluded to it a little bit about like having the data, the data will inform what you're doing. But you want to expand on that a little bit for like what you see happening for North Carolina going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that it, you know, gosh, it's hard to even remember what happened pre pandemic, to be honest with you. <laughs> yes. um, I was saying earlier, 2021 was so long ago, I had to. It's like 10 years get ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. It seems so um, logical now, and we weren't doing things that way before. Um, so I think it's, you know, we use the term game changer probably too often or too much, but, but it really will make a significant difference. And, and as Catherine mentioned, it's going to be really across the board for, for those states who, like us, are, have such diversity across our state. You've got one uh, county that is, you know, like Wake County that has more people in its school system and a bigger budget than some states. Uh, and then you've got some rural counties where they're just trying to get new basketballs. And so, you know, that divergence of districts and be able to have those individuals come forward with plans um, for innovation or some other things that they want to accomplish with the help of DPI and really to be able to prove that out is incredibly important. And it's really important to the legislators who represent those areas. So, so I'll give you one last question, then give you both an opportunity to, to wrap up with your final thoughts. But um, you alluded to one thing that may not go forward, which is uh, the high dosage tutoring program that's just not showing the data. But how are you making some of those tough choices as we come into the, the end of some of these funds? Because some of this stuff will have to, have to end. You talked about science of reading going forward, and the legislature's putting money towards that. But what are, how are you making some of the hard choices? So I, I, I'll share what we're, you know, what we've shared with the legislature as being our priorities, and then, and then I'll let Michael respond. Um, <laughs> chop, chop. Right here on stage, <laughs> right here we're going to hear it. <laughs> no pressure. Well, uh, we, we certainly have been hearing from the field that now that we've invested so much time and money in our elementary school teachers, how can we help our middle school teachers um, not just our language arts teachers because literacy is everyone's responsibility uh, and so how can we help um, those those uh, teachers of adolescents be better with with the literacy challenges that our middle schoolers bring and so we are uh, we'll partner once again with lexia to offer something to um, those, those middle school teachers we also did a data collection and we learned that um, we have many educator prep programs that are offering little to no, little to no methods courses in elementary math instruction. That's a problem. We have math phobic teachers teaching in our elementary schools. And so we're, we're uh, you know, that, that's something that the legislature can, just like they did in the Excellent Public Schools Act, which included some guardrails for our educator prep programs with, with the science of reading instruction in those, those um, hours of instruction, we need to do the, the same thing for math. Um, and then we, we also are looking at the fact that we need an early math screener for, uh, like, well, we have one for literacy, but we don't have one for math. 
So different, some districts have one, but we don't have, they're not all using the same one. So we don't have that data comparison like we do for literacy, which has just been so key. The other thing our data showed us is that um, districts that were extending the use of the early literacy screener to grades four and five are seeing better outcomes in grades three, four, and five. Hmm. So we are, asking the legislature to um, make that mandatory. Um, so I, again, it's a very data, n nothing that we're asking for, I mean, this, this is a, a bi we're on a biennium budget and this is a short session. Nothing that we're asking for is crazy expensive, but it can, all of those asks can be backed up with data. Yeah, and then the, and then the program, so I mean, I pulled my list, the DPI pulls together, the $6 billion that was spent um, in a nice spreadsheet. Uh, over the last few years, you know, it, it's easy, but it's hard to cut programs. It's, it's easy because the program is not working. It's harder because these are groups of people typically who have invested, a, this high dosage tutoring, a lot of people have invested a lot of time and energy because they really cared to do something that they hoped was really going to work. And it's not working the way they thought. And so in, in some sense, it's difficult to, to confront those folks. But it's easy because then we can take those dollars and use it towards something we, we either know is going to work from the data or we think is going to work and we've got the metrics that are laid out on how we're going to be successful in order to evaluate that a year from now or two years from now and hopefully we'll see those gains. And so those are kind of the, that's kind of the, the, the push and pull that we're going to deal with in the short session and the other sessions to come. Sounds like things that will make you ultimately popular, right? So, <laughs> yes. well, let me, um, let me just uh, summarize since we're out of time now is like uh, the data has been a game changer for you um, and not just singular data, single year data, not just answering the question of the moment, but k staying with it and longevity. Um, and that these ESSER funds have given you the opportunity to set the stage for incredible work that will continue on in North Carolina. We're so proud to um, have you here and to have you sharing uh, your successes with. So please thank uh, both of our speakers. Thank you, thank you for having us.